I think we can start. It's already yeah. five minutes, sure. so mm -hmm. let's go. Uh, hello to everybody. My name is Alexander Friedman. I am the founder and the CEO of service VAPI, company VAPI. We help uh, e-commerce traders with warehousing, logistics, all over the Europe. Uh, and we also have created the VAPI community, the community that is uh, dedicated to uh, find more and more interesting and expert information so and share it with you so that your business online business would grow and today we have a wonderful woman with us Jana Jana is our guest she is founder and CEO of biggest Amazon dedicated translation agency Jana nice nice to meet you here nice to you to be with us today Please tell us some words about who you are and what is your company doing. Sure. Thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful intro. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to, to be speaking here today. And uh, hopefully uh, a lot of you could take away some key information from, from today's uh, webinar. Uh, so, yeah, as uh, Alexander mentioned, my name is Jana. I'm the owner of Wild Bee Translations. Uh, we've been around for around two years now, and we love helping people expand to international marketplaces. Um, it's very important to um, um, it's very important to to think about international expansion, something which can definitely help your business. And we've been uh, very successful in that, working with a lot of uh, seven eight figure sellers from the US, UK, Germany, and we've had some pretty good results. And today I'm going to be speaking about strategies that you could uh, apply to your business and uh, basically a lot of mistakes that people do which you could definitely avoid wonderful so the first question that has every person that wants to go internationally is is it scary to go to the country where i don't know the language well i definitely think uh the language is a barrier a lot of people are afraid of and uh, that, this is actually one of the obstacles why people don't want to expand because they're, they're like, I don't have a, an in-house team member who speaks this language and, you know, but like once you get everything set up, like you translate your listing keywords, you get that keyword set up in your PPC campaigns, you might just as well hire occasionally someone who can help you with your customer service. Or you can also outsource that as well to an agency like ours. But um, I don't think uh, it's more, it, it's a hassle if you don't know the language, as long as you know how to have a fresh start on a new marketplace and to use that honeymoon period the right way. Because a lot of people, they, they actually don't know what they're doing. So they're just using completely wrong keywords. They're like spending money on unnecessary things. And that honeymoon period actually, you know, they, they give you, Amazon gives you much more than you actually deserve for your product and your appearance. And you really want to use this time. A lot of people don't, uh, don't use this time like the way they should. And they just never get back in the saddle what after that. You, what do you say to those who are not even doing anything because, because of they, they think that, uh, oh my God, my English is so bad. So, uh, and uh, how I can go to Italian market? I don't know the Italian. What, what just to say to them? Just don't, don't, don't be afraid. Just start to do what? Just start to Google Translate? Just to do anything? Don't be afraid. Uh, listen, listen, do you think that Chinese sellers are afraid that they don't know English and they sell in the US marketplace? And they're just like crushing it, right? Okay. So like, just think of a, you know, a, a Chinese seller or any other seller that probably, you know, you barely could communicate with. How yeah. come that they are an eight figure seller, you know, like just, you know, just, just remove this obstacle from your mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I think that, yeah, the, the, your audience is uh, probably, you know, mostly European and we in Europe, we are more or less familiar with certain languages. So you, you speak at least. English apart from your native or maybe some other language as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's a much, uh, it makes much more sense for you who are sitting in Europe to start and sell in the international marketplaces than many other people from other countries that literally have no uh, language knowledge. 
Um, so I would just say, you know, that you should kind of put down, write on your paper, uh, you know, how much would PPC cost in Italy or in Spain? And maybe my product is like this amazing fit for the Spanish marketplace. I don't think a lot of people even think about it. And I don't think a lot think a lot of people would like sit down and like type their product and go on like Amazon.fr and see how, how many competitors they have over there. You know, I just think that people kind of focus on like UK market and like, you know, because of English and everything, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, German market is the biggest marketplace out there. And also what I don't, I don't think a lot of people know, uh, especially people who just started on Amazon is that I call a, a German marketplace a five-star marketplace because actually like all of these other countries that don't have their own Amazon marketplace, uh, all of those like potential buyers, they get transferred to buy from the German Amazon. So you get the access to much more people than you actually thought. So I always think um, it's a very good thing just to sit and do a little bit of research. Cool, cool. I, I like it. So if you're afraid, just remove this obstacle from your mind because at the same time, uh, the Ch Chinese sellers are crushing uh, the markets all over the world. So exactly. if they can do find out how to do it, you can do it also. <laughs> this is I'll, I'll remember it. Okay, so um, while we're talking, we have uh, uh, our webinar is showed on YouTube and our guests can write the questions there. Please, if you have questions, be free to ask anything and we will answer it because I'm checking uh, what questions come there. And uh, one question for me is, as always, please write who is new from our guests to online business and what marketplaces do you use right now? Through what marketplaces you are selling? This information always helps me and uh, uh, our guests to understand what information to give you. So uh, before we come to your presentation about the translations, I have one uh, topic that is very, very interesting for everybody who is now in online business is what to sell in this period of COVID and after the COVID. So do you, you're working with a lot of sellers, uh, you're helping them on the translations, but at the same time you discuss with them the situation, you see what, what is happening. How do you think? What categories of goods, what products are like the top ones now? With, with what to start selling on the internet? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, also throughout this whole COVID period, like supplements have been doing quite, quite well. And um, uh, I think that now is a really good time to start selling outdoor products because people would just love to go outside and will just use everything they have um, uh, for their garden. Like for instance, like I'm constantly targeted by this lazy spa which is like an inflammatory uh, hot tub. They just target me, I don't know why. And I guess, uh, and, and I've read uh, an information that they've sold, I don't know, like a zillion of like th this product because like this is something that people would love who don't have a pool. And it's like a $500, so it's like a cheaper than a regular hot tub or a pool, definitely. And I just think like all of them, uh, also like a uh, dog, um, um, dog uh, equipment, like which you can like toys for dogs, everything for your dogs, everything would, would be like a DIY kit for you can do together with your family or uh, something that you can do uh, on your own. Also like a lot of camping equipment like uh, yeah. sleeping bags and stuff like that because people will definitely go out like you know camping um yeah. so basically everything what it has to do with the outdoor activity uh with some like a social moment with like playing social games with your friends and family uh definitely like what you should not be focusing on is office equipment <laughs> definitely not but um like uh, desks and chairs and stuff like that but um i would definitely uh, think that a lot of people want to buy something and make uh, their home office more comfortable. So I've also seen an increase with like a lap laptop stands and uh, yeah, you know like some accessories you could use like for your mouse and stuff like that, like headsets. Uh, a lot of people yeah. are now on Zoom calls. So basically, like all of this equipment that you find practical and nowadays use, like definitely that has been like a very very big hit. 
Mm -hmm. um, also, like a lot of people wa want to sell, you know, like body butters and like beauty products. That's always a good category. But like right now, you should definitely be careful with that because um, a lot of um, words are getting flagged now more than ever because of the coronavirus. So like literally we had an example of an Italian, uh, Italian um, keyword of um, like intimate, intimacy oh. bath, uh, which was flat. So because they kind of, I don't know, like uh, Amazon kind of connected that with some medical uh, condition. So they, they flagged that and that was not flagged before, for instance. So like if you're selling any beauty products or anything that you have like some ingredients or you can, for instance, we, we want to avoid, of course, always, uh, even before COVID, you want to avoid things like uh, antibacterial and stuff like that. Um, but now more than ever, like if you are selling a lotion or a powder or something that's like you can use uh, uh, to, to treat um, rash or something like that, you might want to kind of go around it. And, you know, so it's a, it's a very, a very tough thing to sell right now. It will sell, but you really have to pay close attention to how you use your text in any language. And that's yeah. uh, exactly what we're going to talk about today, yeah. about the text. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's proceed to um, your presentation. I'm very, very interested to hear it. And while you will um, uh, talk to the audience and present the information, I will sometimes stop you and ask the questions. Okay? Sure, no problem. Okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen now. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is and wonderful. I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go full screen. Just one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, I'll just make it bigger. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just leave the, the camera on or whatever, mm -hmm. maybe off. Yeah, I'm just gonna make it. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, today we'll be talking about most common mistakes that sellers make when creating their international listings. And I'll be also talking about some strategies, as I mentioned before, and I'm going to have a lot of different examples, some case studies and some um, real, real examples of what we did uh, and what to do, what not to do. So basically everything I'll be talking here today in this presentation uh, is consisted from our experience working with a lot of different clients. Uh, we do around 1,000 listings every month, so we do have a lot of experience with what works, what doesn't work. Um, a lot of people ask me if I am an Amazon seller. I'm not yet a, a seller. Uh, hopefully, I will find time to, you know, just start doing that because I've been planning on doing that for uh, at least a couple of years now. Uh, but uh, we so we don't uh, go into um, a, 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 a sellers' accounts, but we do get a lot of feedback. We reach out to our clients and so they tell us the numbers so that we know what is working, what is not working. Um, so here is the first thing that you are probably uh, making a mistake with when you want to sell internationally or you're maybe afraid to sell internationally because of this thing. So this thing is the translators that, that know what they're doing. A lot of people make a mistake and they hire someone who is just a regular translator on Fiverr. Each part that the translator. So you know, my question is always like, how many people would hire this guy just because he's cheap? And a lot of people would say, I'm gonna hire this guy, which is a completely uh row. Know how to do the keywords. Like the keywords are the ones that are gonna sell your product. Trying to have natural listing. So not to join. Hire someone for washing machine instructions, but for this, really need uh, someone who's gonna know. Uh, like what is the title length for certain categories? Like how many uh, characters are in the bullets? What is the keyword strategy? 
So like a regular translator doesn't know this. So you either have to have someone who has a marketing knowledge or Amazon knowledge. And what's more important is that this guy will fail something, which I like to call the French mom test, which we'll see later. So a French mom test is like this lady who wants to buy diapers and she's gonna like search for the diapers, let's say saying gray diaper bag, for instance, or waterproof diaper bag. If Kevin didn't put any of these keywords in his listing, your product is not gonna pop up and you're just not gonna be relevant for any of these keyword search terms and you're gonna lose your um, rank, especially in that honeymoon period I've mentioned. So definitely Kevin has no idea what he's doing and he will definitely not help you get any sales or profits. So what, will, instance, he, what yeah. will Kevin do? Do you have it? What, how, how Kevin yeah. will write the translation? Yeah, yeah, this is my next example. Yeah, so like uh, the, these are like the leather cashmere gloves, right? So Kevin's example is this regular, let's say German example. And this is like how it looks like. So sometimes it happens that, you know, you have a keyword by accident because this is how they translate to the language. But like, uh, you know, don't do touch screen cashmere gefühlte leather handschuhe. The rule basically is that you have to put the keywords more towards the beginning of the title, which Kevin doesn't know. And you basically, if you, if you don't start with your brand, which was a tendency to start with a brand uh, about six or seven months ago, now people don't start with their brand anymore, but you really want to have the top keywords in the first half of your, of your, um, uh, of your title. So basically when you have this regular text, you, you cannot translate it directly. So Kevin translated this like, don't hold touch with leather cashmere. It's, it's this absolutely like from word to word translator, translation. But when you put the Amazon translation with keywords, this is how it's gonna look like. And we like to uh, mark the keywords in red. So it's quite transparent even to the clients that don't speak a language so that they absolutely can see where the keywords are placed. So you can see here that the, the, this is like much different than the original text, but it has to be like that because if you adjust it and you put the keywords in it, it's definitely not going to um, have, uh, it's gonna have the same text, but you're gonna have a lot of keywords inserted and it's gonna be adjusted a little bit. And the same thing goes also for the first uh, bullet. You know, it's just like, this is how the first bullet is with Kevin. And this is like how this is like with the keywords and a little bit of the adjusting and localization, which I will be also discussing a little bit later. Also, it's very interesting to compare like two different languages. Like for instance, you have a German translation here and the Spanish, which is also like a literate translation word word. Spanish translation with the keywords and like Amazon translation is not gonna look like German one because this really is something which should be different on each of the marketplace. Uh, first of all, keywords are not necessarily going to be the same long tail keyword combination on each marketplace. And also like the adjusting of the style is not going to be the same. So if you compare the Amazon translation on German and Spanish, you see there's you know a quite uh, difference here. Um, one of my favorite questions, can I use Google Translate? And uh, this is something a lot of people think that they could just do because they could save money on it and just, you know, it's gonna be good enough. Uh, Google Translate has come a long way from like translating like, you know, made in Turkey like this or you know, some other crazy Chinglish translations for the Chinese sellers, which I mentioned before. And, you know, it has come a long way from like uh, sounding like an absolutely, you know, a lot of uh, gibberish uh, translation words into actually making a lot of sense, which is what it is basically trying to do today. But one very important thing to, to bear in mind when talking about Google Translate is that um, Google Translate doesn't know what's context. So basically, the Google Translate would not be able to recognize what sort of like a story uh, telling uh, brand branding you want to uh, get to your clients. Uh, it could be good to translate some technical specifications, but nothing more than that. So here's an example of a sweet milk can. So this is the product. It's a coconut milk in a can, for instance. And so people would maybe go to Google Translate because they don't want to do keyword research for every market separately. And if you do the keyword research for the US market and the UK market, you will also see some differences. It's not going to be 100% the same, let alone like all other languages. They all have like their own special long tail keyword combination and not everyone are gonna search for the same things in all countries out there. So if you put a Google Translate here, you're gonna get this translation in Spanish. Now, if you put this translation in Spanish on amazon.es, 
you're gonna get something which has nothing to do with this. Like, right, where's the can, where's the milk, right? Like not, nowhere to be found. So basically what, the word you're looking for, the keyword you're looking for is leche condensada, which Google Translate never actually, you know, got it as a result. So this is what you will get when hiring some translator who's gonna do it. You definitely need human touch when doing these translations. And, and especially then you have to always look your competitors because a lot of times what your translator says is not going to be correct because Amazon is just using a different word for that, which is exactly what the next case is. This is a kitchen faucet. If you put the word faucet, you're going to get Rubinetto, which is actually a proper name for the faucet. And most likely your translator, your, the human translator will also tell you this is Rubinetto. And that's it. But because he's a regular translator, not used to doing any research or anything, this mm -hmm. is it. Like that's his job. He's gonna say this is Rubinetto. But when you type Rubinetto here, you're not gonna get any kitchen faucet. Like kitchen faucet literally shows up at page number three. For page number one is like a lot of like baloney. Like there's like a lot of like crazy things here because this is not the term that Amazon would use for its product. But after a little bit of research, you'll see that Miscelatore Lavello, this is actually the faucet you want to be ranked for. So during this honeymoon period, I'm constantly mentioning, which I find very important, if you put money on Rubinetto, or if you put money on, uh, you know, La Lecha Sucarada Puede, you're just gonna be wasting your money and you're not gonna be ranked for what you want. You're gonna be ranked for something which is completely irrelevant, which is not going to lead the client to buy your product. When you do these keywords, you just want to uh, just want to put yourself in the position of a buyer and be like, if I type this, is this going to lead me to my product or not? So this is like how you should, what you have in mind when like doing the, the keyword research and the keywords you want to be ranked for. So the idea, uh, if, if I understand you correct, the idea is even, even if you hire uh, an agency, I don't know, maybe not yours, maybe the people find some. No, it doesn't matter. Anybody, like even if you hire a regular translator. Check, check the keywords uh, at Amazon and see what, what gets out. Yeah, because yes, exactly. Uh, yes, you showed, if you check, you, you see absolutely different items and, <laughs> and you will lose the money. Yeah, my, my, my key point here is never to translate the, the keywords because you're not gonna get the correct information. If you translate the keyword just from one language to another, you, you can get like faucet completely wrong, you know, done. What I suggest you people should always do is to always do the keyword research for each market separately. Because if you do the keyword research, you're definitely going to get this Miscultura Lavello. If you just translate it and without doing any other research on your competitors or anything, you're never going to get good results. So do, do the keyword research for all the markets. Separately, wrote, don't translate your keywords. I wrote such sentence. You, 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 I want you to check me. Stylistic translation is not the same as marketing translation. No, absolutely not. Uh, this is like when you want to hire a translator, um, anyone on Fiverr, there are a lot of good translators out there. If you hire someone who is like, uh, I don't know, specialized in legal translations or uh, I don't know, maybe some like a medical translations, contracts, he is not gonna know anything about the style which is used in marketing translations. So I would only hire someone that has marketing experience or has done a lot of e-commerce type of translations. Because this is like, you know, if you wanna go to your, if you wanna hire a dentist uh, to, to, check, to examine your ear canals, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's a completely different specialization of, of different sorts of translators. Okay, super. Please continue. I like it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So number two is to know your markets, which a lot of people, as I said before, they don't do any uh, market research. They don't know who their audience is. They don't know who they're addressing. And even if they're selling a product, which is going to make sense for that marketplace. So like in Europe, we have all of these marketplaces. I mentioned already that Germany is a five-star marketplace because you get uh, access to a lot more uh, buyers than on the German marketplace. And the newest marketplace is the Dutch marketplace, uh, which uh, has expanded enormously, at least when it comes to inquiries and people who want to sell out there. I suppose that a lot of people just want to be there first. We've had tons of requests. I think we did like over 500 ASINs for the sellers since October last year. 
um, the, the Dutch marketplace hasn't still rolled out the PPC for, for the marketplace, but I guess when they roll it out at the end of the year, I guess that that's when people are going to start seeing a lot of uh, good results. Uh, Japanese marketplace is quite interesting. It's as big as Germany and it has a lot of potential buyers, but this marketplace is very specific. Um, also, uh, also like, um, you know, obstacle of the language being like in a different alphabet is something that yeah. just chase people chases away from that marketplace. But also like it's a very a unique marketplace marketplace. You really have to know if you have a good product for it or not. So definitely something that um, needs more research. You really want to um, see if your, uh, I don't know, um, dog supplement is something that Japanese people would buy. Even though it's selling very well in Europe, maybe that's not something for Japanese marketplace. So it has a great potential, but also great risk that your product might not work. Uh, also, Mexican market is something which is very uh, interesting for the U.S. Uh, sellers, especially almost, uh, you know, 70% of them, if they, in, in case they want to expand, they expand to Mexico and Canada. And also, there's an Amazon Middle East. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, translations for this marketplace, but um, the problem with Middle East is that they have a lot of very, very big local marketplaces where people still buy from. So it is yet to see, you know, what sort of impact Amazon is going to have on this marketplace. What? Definitely, people have a lot of money, and they could be potentially, you know, spending them on Amazon. But you know, it's uh, it's yet to see over there. Do you know the, um, Do you know the names? What are the names of the local uh, marketplaces that are competing with Amazon there? Oh, I forgot. I had this written, but there's like two different Amazon, two different marketplaces. I know that the Dutch, uh, for instance, the Dutch marketplace had the biggest local marketplace where everybody bought from. It's called Ball, Ball dot dot com, and I honestly thought that Amazon didn't have a chance or that people. People would not be showing any interest because they already are buying everything from Ball. But I was very surprised by how many people were actually interested in, in selling on the Dutch marketplace as well. Okay. Uh, while as the on the uh, Middle East, it's not quite that. I also think it might be uh, one of the things is that uh, because the Dutch marketplace is now part of the Pan European program, and the Middle East is not. So I think that uh, Amazon pushes uh, sellers who already sell in Europe to also expand to Dutch marketplace and not so much for the Middle East. This is what I think it's um, mm -hmm. a problem. So when talking about people who place their products or haven't even thought about like who they're gonna sell to, uh, it's not only like small brands on Amazon that are affected by this. A lot of very, very big uh, brands uh, literally had no idea what they were doing. So for instance, like we have Kim Kardashian and she has her uh, shapewear now called Skims, but um, she wanted to call her uh, brand uh, Kimono. And the Japanese government was so upset that she chose the name, which actually uh, is the name for their national attire. And they got really upset. They wanted to ban like the, the wholesale of her products in Japan. And she was forced to change her name. So there was just like just the, in the nick of time before she started selling this product, she got like a red flag from Japan and she changed the name to Skims. Uh, so th she like literally avoided a uh, multi-million disaster just because she didn't think it through how this would affect the Japanese marketplace being a very, very big and huge marketplace. Uh, also like one of my favorite examples is Hyundai Kawaii, uh, formerly uh, also known as Kona in some parts of the Europe. Well, as in Portugal, uh, the word Kona is a slang name for a female organ. So people would just like not going to buy, you know, like a Hyundai Kona. And uh, so uh, Hyundai had to withdraw the whole series of the cars and they had to change the name to Kauai, which is just another Hawaiian island to pick. So it was a name to Hyundai Kauai. So this is something uh, people really uh, never thought about. And well, one of like, the biggest disasters that happened is with the brand Dolce Gabbana. They wanted to land, launch like this um, cool video, promotional video for their big Chinese campaign. So Chinese e-commerce is the biggest out there. Uh, you really want this to be good and thought through. But they launched this video where you could have an, where you could see an Asian lady eating pizza with chopsticks. So they thought this was an amazing idea combining, you know, like Italian and Chinese culture but Chinese people were so furious because they're so super sensitive about their culture. They decided to ban all Dolce & Gabbana merchandise on their market. 
And Deutsche Bank literally lost, lost like billions of dollars by this very stupid mistake that doing no uh, market research at all. And one of the very great stories is about Walmart on Japanese marketplace. So Walmart uh, opened 400 stores because they were very convenient. They were very convinced that their, uh, their stores would be very successful. It's a very successful US brand. And why should we adjust to any other marketplace? Because we should just go as we are. We are Walmart. Um, and they failed miserably. They had to close around 400 stores. And that happened because uh, Japanese people, they want to have like this special shopping experience when buying any of the products. They really want to have like this um, something special in doing that. They also like to go on a scavenger hunt looking for discounts. And Walmart literally has discounted discounts everywhere. Uh, they don't offer locally sourced produced food, which is something that Japanese really, really like. And didn't offer any sort of special shopping experience. So Walmart just completely failed, and I think they they have to close absolutely all stores by by today. What, what I is think. it? Special shopping experience. Well, shop. That's what Costco could offer to, to Japan. Special social shopping experience is something that they haven't seen before. Maybe something very interesting or new. Something weird, maybe you know, like Costco, like is well known for selling uh selling in bulk, and this is something what Japanese people are not used to buying. But they couldn't really like this concept because like, oh, wow, let's go there and buy like 15 bottles of champagne or I don't know, 55 toilet papers or something, you know, and they found this as a very kind of unique shopping experience. And they absolutely loved Costco and Costco are doing very well uh, in Japan till this day. So, you know, like when thinking about your brand or anything, you know, just kind of offer something which is kind of unique and something which is maybe not. This was a risky move because this was not something which is typical in Japan, but it worked. I think honestly, Costco did like a really good market research and they were like, hmm, I think we should do it because I think people will be like completely like, you know, having this like shopping craze and like buying these products that they usually don't buy in bulk, creating like a special thing for them, you know? So yeah. definitely it was a good, a good uh, choice. And what it can be in online? In offline, I understand the shopping experience. Experience. What different yeah. shopping experience can be in online for Japan? I think like an online shopping experience is like uh, how you create and promote your brand. Like for instance, what sort of infographics you use in your A plus content, uh, how that's adjusted to each market separately. Like you're not going to have, maybe you're not going to have like uh, gray and black pictures. Maybe you're going to have like fluo pictures of, I don't know, people hanging from the trees or something like that you know like something that's gonna make your brand stand out and be kind of special and maybe when you send that product you're gonna have like a very unique packaging or the product is gonna have some like really cool features and stuff like that so that's like making like a like a shopping experience from buying online to actually getting the product okay super and when it comes to your uh, Amazon listings um, it's also like something that you should definitely apply you know the market research actually adjusting as much as you can, but also like very important to do the marketing research because you can get banned very easily. So what happened with one of our clients, he had this shampoo and he had a lot of different ingredients. They were selling without any problems on the UK marketplace. But when he wanted to sell this product on the German marketplace, he didn't do his homework. And one of these uh, ingredients was marked as a subscription drug on the German marketplace and his product got banned. So he never even thought that, you know, or maybe one of these ingredients is illegal or maybe not allowed to be uh, sold uh, freely in some other marketplaces. So mm -hmm. also something to think about, especially when selling uh, some beauty products or anything that has some ingredients or materials or anything, you know, that needs the disclaimer. Okay, so the localization is a little bit, but a little bit in comes to the Amazon marketplaces. It actually should be done. So a lot of uh, sellers are US based, for instance, and US has like this um, very salesly style and like with a lot of sales pitch, pushing people into buying products. And this is definitely something which would never work on the German marketplace. If you hired a translator to do the US marketplace, the uh, US listing to German, and if they would do it as a literal translation, so word by word, it will confuse German sellers and it will be very weird that that sort of approach. 
So here are a couple of examples like we did with uh, one of our clients, Pioneer. Uh, they were exhibiting a very big show in Germany and they wanted to have like a lot of different billboards. So like their original word was passion, we go beyond care. This had to be changed into passion, we go beyond customer service. Because the word care is a little bit too emotional for the German marketplace. It's like you something for your friends or maybe cost hospital. It's like really focused on emotions and not on your goals and action. German marketplace is all about actions, like being very transparent. Tell me what your product does. How does it solve my problem? And what are the features and ingredients? I really don't care how you will get emotional with your product. So don't, don't give me this. Like give me just like transparency, all clear and straightforward. German marketplace is also the marketplace which gives the most refunds from all of the worldwide marketplaces out there. So mm -hmm. if the Germans think that they've been like tricked or like, hmm, this is not what you promised in your text, they're just going to re return your product. And you're just going to have to refund. Um, also, the second set is humility. We go beyond assumptions. It was changed to respect. We live up to what we promise our customers. So humility and the customer service is even worse. You know, like seeing mm -hmm. humble customer service, like Germans are like, no, I wouldn't buy it. It's not professional. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me that you have a good customer service. Also, some of the words to avoid is like, show the world with whom your heart beats in saying blah, blah, blah. We just changed that to show the world that you belong together, which is less emotional, less uh, this like uh, kind of attaching and more professional and more clear for the German customer. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite examples is a glass espresso cup where you have like the US uh, listing saying cool, cooler, coolest in the first bullet. Well, as the Germans say, elegant and stylish so get on with the features and tell me like why is this a good quality product uh also like own the enigma just like that old ship in a bottle your granny had yada 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 so this is like going very into deep into emotionally and stuff like that with wordplay and metaphors the germans will just say thermal isolated glass like that's it you know just like tell me how i use this product and mm -hmm. why is it good also, a lot of people, uh, the Germans, they would prefer not to see if something is made in China. So I would definitely um, uh, recommend not using that. I was very surprised that pe some people actually still have that in their listings. Uh, but, you know, definitely you don't want to have that. Um, it doesn't play any role. If people love to, I mean, Germans, they love to see like made in Germany because this is like what's like quality for them, right? Mm -hmm. But not all people can have made in Germany. So if you just if you if you don't have some country that you actually think that's like very high quality like I don't know like maybe Scandinavian design or Swiss time or something like that don't put it in your listings for the German marketplace definitely um, also as I said like get it now buy this product this is something you should not put in the German marketplace don't push people into buying the product they just hate that um, also a couple more examples super cute children pamper yourself in luxury should definitely be avoided for this marketplace. Um, next thing is keywords. We already have the talk about, you know, doing the keyword research uh, separately on each marketplace, but I would just like to talk a little bit about the tools that can definitely help you uh, get there. Uh, definitely number one is Helium 10, our favorite uh, tool ever. Uh, a lot of cool uh, features, a lot of really, really good details, but you have to pay for it. So if you're not ready to pay for it, you are welcome to use Sonar. Uh, it's a Celix tool and it's absolutely free. It covers all international marketplaces. It gets you search volume, which is basically one of the most important things when choosing the keywords to put in your listing. Uh, and it's for free. Uh, and you can definitely get some idea on what works, what doesn't work. And third one is something I really like. It's called AMZ Suggestion Expander. It's an add-on Chrome tool. It doesn't give you any of the search volume details, numbers, or anything. But mm -hmm. if you are the first to sell in the marketplace or you don't have a lot of competitors, because all of these tools, they kind of would extract the information from the competitors, uh, this is something that can get you like a lot of really cool ideas for the keywords. All you have to do is like you should like write the main word for the product, and then you're going to get the keywords which come before and after with possible keyword combination. So like ideally you should use like this one plus like a Salix or a Helium 10 tool. Um, now this is the question we've been through, like do long tail keywords the same on all marketplaces? They're definitely not. 
so you know you want to have to do this like uh, for each marketplace but what's very important when you use helium 10 is that for the german language we a lot of people know that there are a lot of, a lot of really big long compound words and this compound words actually consist of two or three keywords inside of them so it's an actually long tail keyword so if you have like this fan, fan, fan boste, it's a hairbrush Mm -hmm. If you put, um, like your regular helium tent is set here for word count number two. And this is like the, um, the, 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 the results you're going to get. Like all of them are going to be like two separate words. So what's a, what's a really big mistake here is just to rely on these results. Because uh, for this, 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 this fun borste is one word. It's a compound word as it, as it is. But if you put this fun borste and put number two, you're not going to get any more other compound words. You're going to get only two words and a lot of your competitors would be ranked for this compound word, which you're not going to see here in the results. So what you have to do is change the word count after doing the number two, change the word count to number one and do the keyword research again. And then you're going to get a lot of uh, compound words, which consist of one word and you're going to get a full overview of the keyword that you could be ranked for. So just don't skip the step when doing this for the German marketplace. Uh, also for the French marketplace, um, we know that there are like a lot of accents over letters and in the search results, you're going to get a lot of those without the accents. Now, a lot of people ask me like, so what, what should I do? Like I get like some really good, really high search volume uh, keywords and like I cannot place them in my front end listing because this is considered as grammatically incorrect. So even though the people search for this without the accents, this is something which is not going to be like sounding nicely and being very weird and non-professional to a French buyer. So basically, uh, what you can do is you can just put this entry protection, you can put it in caps lock. So you just write it in caps and you would be able to use a keyword without any accents on top of the letters. And this is considered as grammatically correct. So just to give you an idea, you could use this keyword as the, 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 the key feature for your bullets. Like, I think it's personally very good. And this is what we use. Like when you write a bullet, if you have like a, at the beginning of your bullet, if you write caps, uh, this is something which is visually going to be very good. And if you can just enhance your features for your product in caps lock and, and also use keywords there, that's going to be immensely good. Um, title is forbidden to use the caps, but in bullets, you can still use it and it visually looks very nice. Uh, oh, right. My slide just ran away. It was from the, um, hair, hair style. This is like the, the compound words that we get for the German market. Uh, okay. So now a little bit about the strategy. A lot of people don't have the strategy. A lot of people have been using keyword stuffing. A lot of them still do. And I'm really surprised that they still do because this is absolutely something you should not, uh, you know, you should not be doing. So basically the ideal strategy, like this, this is keyword stuff. You know, this is actually like a listing I came across. This is a, these are bullets just stuffed with keywords. And I just guess this is a grandfathered listing and that's why it's still there. You know, I just, if you try to do something like this today, you will definitely not be able to do it. Um, so basically depending on the length of the title, usually it's 199 character, but for other um, uh, categories, you can have 80, you can have 50. Depending on the length of your um, title, like for instance here, ideally it should be like three to five keywords. Definitely strive to put the best keyword after the brand name or to start with this. Uh, why is this important? It's important because if you have like the main keyword here and then you put the dash in the URL of your product, your super URL, you're gonna have this keyword written as well there. So this is also for help you for the Google ranking. It's going to also get uh, indexed for Google. So whatever you put before this first dash, it's going to go to the super URL. Um, also like three to five keywords in the title, like the top keywords should be in your title definitely. And then like the second best should go in your first and your second title. A lot of people say that the first thousand characters are the ones that are getting indexed. So you really don't want to go on like writing novels in your bullets. I would say this is the perfect length for the bullet and you can get all five bullets indexed definitely with your title uh, if you go like under 1000 characters. What's also very important is an Amazon app, a mobile app, uh, because in the mobile app, the product description comes before the bullet. So, so, so you really want to put, let's say one or two really good keywords if possible in the first two sentences of your description. And then it goes down to the, down to the bullets. 
uh, if you have A plus uh, content, it's always good to keep the product description in backend because this definitely gets indexed if under like 1000 together with the wallet. Uh, also, when I'm talking about keywords, uh, customer reviews also get indexed. So you can get like a lot of really cool ideas over there. So uh, you can use the, the um, uh, review downloader from uh, Helium 10 as well. And you can just download the reviews and you can see like what the keywords are the clients are uh, using there. You can maybe use them in your, uh, in your uh, listings. Um, also, uh, what's very important is that the clients sometimes they can really, uh, you know, help you find new keywords because they can find new use for your product. For instance, like we had one, one uh, of our uh, uh, sellers, he was selling, uh, it was like a marker, like a marker that kids could, I don't know, do homework with. And one guy said like, it was such a good color, like a really uh, long lasting black color that he could like fix his uh, color on his chair, like on the legs of the chair in black. And mm -hmm. then the client decided to use that every six or seven months. And this is also what like, you know, like you can find a different purpose product and like in the, those reviews you can find that your uh, product is a problem solver for something completely different uh, also check the competitors one star reviews because they can give you like a really good idea of what you can emphasize on in your bullets for instance like if you're selling like a cup uh, and like a travel mug and uh, i don't know people are complaining that the handle on the travel mug like breaks very often you can put it in your bullet like our handle doesn't break like it's a like be your like a super uh, feature you know mm -hmm. so you can get a lot of ideas just like by researching competitors uh reviews also really good tip for keywords is to uh make them seasonal so like um when optimizing your product which i definitely suggest people should do uh like you can make them like a little bit of a you know like a mother's day keyword or christmas or halloween if you have a good product fit definitely something that um should be working uh get the calendar for the country you're selling in and find if they have some like maybe very big holidays and you can adjust the keywords a little bit for that special holiday for instance and to sum it all up here are two uh case studies from uh, uh two of our clients uh as you see like uh, when they first started like literally they had like a 82 percent like revenue in germany they were like literally doing nothing and after a whole year they had like a thousand two hundred eighty one percent growth and this like goes out to all of the other marketplaces after basically adjusting their listings to have a really good keyword strategy, which I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they were selling a category of uh, kids products. And the second uh, client, uh, they were selling uh, something for outdoors uh, before Corona, but you know, uh, they were still getting amazing results. And the Spanish Italian market, Italian market in 2020 also has grown immensely. Um, they were having just um, testing other different uh, translation agencies, but they were just doing regular translation work. As I said, I would always say that the keywords are number one, and then the natural flow of the text definitely just comes right after that. Ideally, you will have two things, but what is it worth to have like this beautifully written listing by Kevin when your product is not going to pop up? You know, um, definitely your product is going to sell if you have a good product, but just imagine what how much more could you do. If you have a really good optimized listing, good keywords, even better keywords to use in your PPC campaigns. So that's something to think about today. And here is our website. If you, any of you guys have questions, advice, anything I can help out with. If you have uh, listings that are already translated and you're wondering if they're underperforming, why they're underperforming or what could be done to be improved, uh, feel free to shoot me an email directly to me and we can definitely uh, give you some advice on how that can be improved for, for, uh, for free. Thank you so much for listening. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was it was like tornado. You yeah, it was a to, lot of information. Yeah, a lot of information. But, but you wanted to put it in the, the time box. I, I feel that you were talking very fast, but uh, I'll, I'll have to repeat the video to, uh, to clarify some things, but it was I, uh, I very, very, to... very useful, very useful. Yeah, I, I just like... wanted to kind of pack it with a lot of information. You said that this video is going to be available for later as well. Yeah. So, you know, like people don't have to listen and apply every, every single one of this, but I just think that they will find some very uh, good and useful information they could try. You know, like you can try everything I said, you can try yourself. And then you, you can see like how it goes. And if it doesn't go, you know who to ask.
That's yeah, that, I, I like this webinar very much because this is exactly what I'm searching for: some practice, practice, yes. and practical yes. uh, tips for for uh, online traders to to be more successful. Uh, yeah. Wonderful! Thank you very much. I've got one question for you from myself. Uh, okay. Um, you said that German market is more about actions, not emotions. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah. what about other countries? What what uh, you can say? Maybe maybe you have the same categories for different markets for Spanish, yeah, well, for Italian, yeah. French market. Yeah, uh, honestly, French, Spanish, and Italian marketplace are not that different. They're kind of more uh -huh. similar, I guess, because it's like all kind of the you know like the Roman language and the culture is quite mm -hmm. you know it's not it, it, there are not that many differences um definitely u.s style would never work also for those so whatever i said for the german marketplace i would say stick to that but just a little bit more mellow this is like for the, all these marketplaces and a very interesting thing which uh my translator team told me for the dutch marketplace for instance being very close to the German, but they're a little bit also more progressive than they are. For instance, like they would um, not like to use, like it's all about this like gender equality and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like they would not like to have like the uh, keywords that say like toys for girls and toys for boys. It's like okay. toys for kids. Yeah, they would like, or like pink and blue is for boys and girls and stuff like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. like people would not, be uh, so specific in buying those and and and, and um, surprisingly also those keywords don't have that, that that big of a search volume actually which solely proves that point you know so mm -hmm. bearing that in mind for the dutch marketplace but when it comes to all these uh, spanish french and, and italian i wouldn't have anything so so radical to say about any any of these okay. as i would for yeah and so how will you describe the uh, u.s style U.S. style is very salesly. It's like you know our best product features, like get it now until it's too late and stuff like that. It's like a like when you see like a commercial like online or like you know telecommercials, like you know like making the sales pitch in every bullet. This yeah. is like uh, what the U.S. does, and sometimes it doesn't even focus on the features as much as on the sales pitch moment, you know. Uh -huh. But it works in the states. It absolutely works, but it wouldn't it wouldn't work as much in Europe. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, I don't see. I, I, I'm not sure if our if our YouTube is working good, but I don't see the questions there. So uh, we have already the timing, and I have uh, standard questions that I ask every guest. Right. Um, uh, I told you about before. So the first question is: uh, Sure, can you tell in short? three takeaways for our guests or for the our future viewers like in short do how to be successful in e-commerce in online trading three takeaways from you okay first of all i think that you definitely need a good product uh i just think you have to dedicate a lot of time to finding a good product don't rush into things just you know think about it like do a lot of research uh, talk to people and then uh, if you want to be serious seller you really will have to invest a lot of time so if you think just you're gonna get rich overnight because that's what people on Amazon do you're terribly wrong it's a full-time job and it, and, it, and it means total full dedication uh, I heard a lot of uh, different LinkedIn connections you know having a full-time jobs and now being uh, you know affected by corona uh, wanting to sell on Amazon and I told every one of them like look this is not a hobby it's like literally this is going to be a full-time job and this is when you're going to be successful so don't rush into things and take some time uh, to just you know do the things the right way so this is number one okay. uh, number two is definitely uh, to know what the market needs like so do the market research this is absolutely mandatory wherever you want to sell whatever you want to do like e-commerce uh, anything uh, just know the market, know your, know who your target audience is. So don't just start selling your product. I don't know who my target audience is. You have to know this. It's going to be kids. It's going to be like adults, uh, seniors. You have to know this. And this is going to help you adjust in so many ways. And the number three, really have a strong marketing team. Like marketing is what sells your product. I think that um, especially, well, I mean, into listing optimizations and everything, but I definitely think that PPC or Google ads or whatever you want to do 
is something that's going to sell your products. I've seen some really crappy products sell just because somebody has been doing a really good job on marketing PPC and everything connected to that. Cool. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, the next one is three things what not to do, like never you're. Okay. Uh, so never, um, never register a limited or LLC company before even <laughs> beginning with one product. A lot of people just do it like other way around. So like literally you have to start with, you have to start small, but have a big vision. That's it. Okay. A lot of people just like start the other way around. And it really is, you know, um, even <laughs> though if you worked in a really big company, if you have never worked for yourself, you're not going to know how it goes. It's completely different when you work for yourself and when you work with somebody else and you think you're managing a really big company. And when you start from yourself, you really cannot even manage yourself. So, you know, like know your steps and how to start, but have an absolutely great vision and know where you're heading. This is like number one. Oh. Uh, number two is never work with your friends. <laughs> this is also <laughs> something I've and, learned. And that, relatives. Yes, relatives. <laughs> never, I know that the, the, these are the for people that are going to help you out at the beginning and probably are not, not going to be able to afford anybody else. But as long as you maybe hire a friend or relative just for the beginning or for the start, this is where it should end. As soon as you get your e-commerce or Amazon running, hire someone you don't know and you, you, who you don't have any strings attached to. Okay. And, uh, number three? Something, something uh, about translation. Three, something about translation. translation. Yeah. And number three, uh, never hire, as I, I cannot like, emphasize this most, never hire a regular translator to do your Amazon listing. Regular translator can do your follow-up emails and some other regular text, but the regular translator has to know something about localization. Regular translator has to be a native person who lived in the country or is from the country who knows the customs and the way of addressing. As I mentioned with the pioneer example, like somebody who just like learned the language at university, he would not, or she would not be able to do that because they, they could not grasp the culture of that marketplace. So if hiring a translator, tell them that you need localization or just hire someone who has definitely marketing experience and or uh, pre preferably Amazon experience. It really pays off when you pay like to get your listing translated, you pay that once. It's not like PPC or any other services that you have like a prescription plan. This is once, so you might invest your money uh, smartly. So I write, don't hire Kevin. Don't so hire all, Kevin. All, yeah. all the Kevins from all the translation <laughs> companies. <laughs> they <laughs> are fired. Yes, they are fired. The Kevins are fired, yeah. <laughs> okay, and the last one. So uh, I, I like this webinar very much. You're a very smart and wise personality. You've Thank built you. a company by yourself and you're doing 1,000 listings per month. That's, that's a huge amount. Yeah. Uh, can you share with us and with all the guests some life hacks, uh, your personal life hacks, how to be successful uh, in general and in online business? Okay, well, for me as an entrepreneur, it was a quite rocky road. And I was not this person who was like, I'm just going to crush this. I get the, I got this. And actually the person like talking, I was talking about like coming from the corporation, doing everything upside down. That was me, you know? So I did like everything other way around. But now when I, when I have this business, like my next business is definitely going to, you know, start the way it should. So my number one tip would be to, to surround yourself with positive people and people who support you. Um, even sometimes it's very hard to find these people, um, especially for me, it was very hard because, uh, you know, like living in Serbia, a lot of people were like, why did you quit your highly paid position as a COO in this very, very big Danish e-commerce yeah. only to just start like, what is this? Like translations, like are you crazy? So like I had like literally zero support, but in time I managed to just kind of, uh you know chase uh, away all the negativity and like people who i don't like and just surround myself with people who think that i will do good and who actually going to uh give me my confidence back basically yeah. so this is number one the the you know the negativity people have to go uh number two and what's really important is i am not much of a, like a sports person but i really think that you know just going out for a walk for like 30 minutes every day really helps you clear your mind. 
So I really think this is very, very important. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be one of those people who are going to tell you like, you have to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, go run 10 kilometers, then like do yoga and then read a book. Like I, I'm not one of these people. I mean, maybe it works for somebody else, which is fine, but it doesn't work for me. I hate waking up very early. I wake up like around 8 a.m. This is my earliest, you know, when my day starts. But I always want to go out for a walk or do something what, what is pleasurable, pleasurable for me. For instance, like I play the piano and I tend to play every now and then because that's some sort of like a meditation for me. It just kind of helps me like space out and just not think about anything. So if you can do like a walking or, you know, doing some hobby you really enjoy, I think it's very important that you ha can shut, uh, shut off your brain uh, for 30 minutes every day and kind of get a reset. I just, I'm a strong believer in that. And then once you've done that, your mind will be grateful and you will come up with better ideas, better solutions. And that's absolutely something that works. Make your mind rest. Yes, make your, make your mind rest, rest. And, in and, any and, way. Like it doesn't have to be a meditation. And I really hate when people say like, like you should meditate and then you just be like a loser because you don't meditate. I just think that, you know, uh, you could, uh, you could like uh, exchange meditation for anything else that will make your mind clear and resting. Definitely. So whatever works for you, just find, find the way, you know, also like I really hate reading business books. Uh, or self-help books. Like I've read, a, I read a couple of them because I was like curious, but I just, I don't know. Like I just didn't find them so helpful and I just kind of lost interest throughout like half the way of the book. So I'm just going to say that, you know, like uh, um, having this company and everything and my motivation and vision was coming from me, not from these books. So even though you don't like to read books, doesn't mean that you're going to be a failure. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to come up with something which is going to be absolutely brilliant. So it just depends on what do you want. But a lot of times you just feel that society has put like this, like a, you know, like must do's on your list. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be successful. And I just say that's complete bullshit. So you're, you're saying just do as you feel and go further. Well, yeah, do, do as you feel. But the, the best way how you should practice is like basically just doing it in practice. A lot of people are really good in theory and speaking in theory, but none of them have actually done that in practice. I know a couple of business coaches that haven't had a successful business, but they are very successful as business coaches. And so I, I'm not really sure how that works. But I really believe that if you, if you hear something or if you, uh, you know, read something, you definitely have to apply that and see how, how that works. Um, and number three, which I really like, this is my favorite thing, is talking to people, like getting into masterminds, getting into networking with people who have something uh, similar story to yours, but are on a little bit of a higher level than you are. Mm -hmm. Because... You, but there's nothing, of course, it feels good for your confidence to talk to someone who has the same problems as you, but he's not going to solve your problem. So you really have to go and like step up your game on somebody who has like a, gone one step further and just see how you can get to that step. So my absolutely mandatory for me is to talk to people, talk to other entrepreneurs, uh, be part of, I mean, nowadays there are like so many like these like uh, online uh, masterminds and stuff like that, where you can actually talk to people, tell them their problems, and they're going to be speaking from their experience and telling you how you, how you might solve that. And then you can apply. And that is something that has been the most helpful uh, for from all of these three things. Uh, I like, I like what you're saying because like, practi practical stuff is always stronger than the theories. So yes, while, definitely. While, while someone is reading a book and think about Siri at the same time, Yana is doing 1,000 listings per month. So yeah, or <laughs> if, not. <laughs> if you want to be successful, just do just do the things and do them fast. Yeah, exactly. Just you know, go out there and do what you have to do. Honestly, like the more you uh, you know uh, procrastinate, the the worse it's gonna be for you and. Honestly, like I, I've met a lot of different sellers like during the two years. I've been also speaking at worldwide conferences and some un unmanageable things happen when you just try to dare to try something. You doesn't really have to do anything with your background. I know a lot of sellers, they're like basically street school, no education, nothing. And others were like, you know, PhDs and they do equally well. You know, it doesn't really matter where you come from. 
and what your background is, the important thing is your mindset and how willing you are to be dedicated to the new thing you're starting to do in your life. Okay. Thank, okay, Jana, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this webinar. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, again, uh, with you today was Alexander Friedman. I am the owner and CEO of company VAPI. Please visit our website. Any questions about warehousing, logistics, courier services, any, any operational stuff that you need help with in all the Europe, in all the countries of Europe, please write us and we will help you. Anything about the translations and the best keywords, selling keywords, please write to Jana. Uh, Yana's company ELT translation. We have, we've got the, the her website in the description of the webinar. Uh, we both will be glad to help you to build your business and make it great. Definitely, yeah. go out and sell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much, and see you. See you in real life. <laughs> yeah. See you in real life. Yes. <laughs> okay.